Uh, last summer about this time, I began to notice uh, a few unusual dead patches in the grass in my yard. And you, if you know anything about me, you know that uh, I, I take it as a personal affront uh, when my lawn is not cooperating with me. And uh, especially as it got dry, uh, these spots would show up. And what was unusual about them is that they had very precise boundaries. Uh, they would have completely dead grass budding right up next to completely green grass. It was weird. I mean, I know that I've got uh, these giant uh, limestone boulders just underneath the surface in my yard. In fact, uh, one of my fence posts is set in a hole that was jackhammered out of a limestone boulder and then concrete was poured into it. But those kinds of big rocks like that are, are usually further below the surface and shouldn't impede grass roots. Uh, so I had a hunch as to what was going on. And so I grabbed that dead sod and I pulled it back and sure enough, uh, the persons who had sodded my yard had decided it was okay to lay brand new sod on concrete overspill that was in the lot from when my house was built. I mean, they had nothing to which they could take root. As long as, long as uh, the rain was falling and the temperatures were cool, no one was any the wiser. But when the weather changed, the problems could not be masked anymore, and I found out what was really underneath. Uh, that image is something like the image that Jesus is communicating to us in our passage today from Luke. So if you would turn there, please, Luke chapter uh, 6, and find verse 43 in your copy of God's Word. And having found it, would you stand to honor the reading of uh, God's Word with me from Luke 6, beginning in verse 43. No good tree bears bad fruit nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, obviously, an ancient Middle Easterner is not going to have any idea what you're talking about uh, using an illustration of sod dying in your yard. But Jesus did use an illustration with which they could identify the image of a fruit-bearing tree. And in verse 43, that image is unpacked simply. Good trees bear good fruit, and bad trees bear bad fruit. The quality of the tree is measured by the quality of the product. And then Jesus expands the metaphor a little bit, saying that you don't expect to harvest figs from thorn bushes nor grapes from brambles. So if the point of the previous word picture was that the quality of tree uh, is measured by the quality of the product, the point here is that the nature of the tree is revealed by the nature of its product. Thorny brambles bear thorns, fruit trees or vines in the case of of grapes bear fruit. And then he zeroes in on the application. The human heart is the analog to the metaphor he is using. A heart that is bad produces bad fruit. Similarly, a heart that uh, is, is good will bear good fruit. Also, a heart will bear the kind of fruit that it is built to bear. Back in February, after the shooting at the Super Bowl parade, I heard uh, newscaster after newscaster say something like this. This is just not who we are as a city. And every time, every time, 
I said, that's exactly who we are as a city. I mean, I get what the people were trying to communicate, and uh, I even agree with it to a certain point, but the uncomfortable truth is that the gun violence that erupted at that parade did not come out of nowhere. It was just the most visible manifestation of the violence that resides in the heart of our community and really in any community. I hear similar things said when someone falls shockingly into sin, and, and typically it's, it's falling into some kind of sexual sin. And I'll hear people say, particularly friends and family members, this isn't who they are, and every time I will lovingly but firmly push back and say that's exactly who they are. And again, I get what people are, are trying to say, but the uncomfortable truth is that the sin existed a long time before we ever saw it. It did not come out of nowhere. It's what their life naturally produced. And this is the point Jesus is illustrating with this word picture of the tree and fruit. And then Jesus kind of switches up the word pictures he wants to use and moves from agriculture to construction. But in doing so, he shifts the, the emphasis in the, in the fruit-bearing word picture. His point was that a life produces what it is built to produce. Uh, the fruit reveals the root. But in the construction metaphor, uh, the emphasis is on how storms expose the flaws in the foundation. If the foundation of a house is anchored to a rock, uh, storms won't knock them down. The first house that Julie and I built was when I pastored this lovely little small town in northwestern Oklahoma. And when the house was being built, I was walking the site with our contractor, and I asked uh, him about these steel plates that I saw anchoring the frame to the foundation and about the straps that were around the ceiling joints. And he told me, that they were, and I don't know if this is the technical term, look at me, but this is what he told me. He said, those are tornado anchors designed to kind of help hold the frame down and the roof on the building in the event of a tornado. Now, here's the deal. This was, this was just two years after the May 3rd, 1999 tornado in the suburbs of Oklahoma City, about 45 minutes away, that had the strongest winds ever recorded on planet Earth. In fact, it went off the Fujita scale. It went past an F5. That tornado literally ripped sod out of the ground and, and took, when it crossed uh, asphalt highways, the asphalt out of the roadbed. I mean, it was a devastating tornado. And so, obviously, no amount of anchoring is going to hold a house if that kind of tornado came through. But we lived in a world where everybody was thinking about it and wanting to do everything they could, and the precautions they were taking were going to help that house if a lesser tornado passed nearby. And that is Jesus' picture here. His other picture is that of a house with an improper foundation, really no foundation. And when the storms come, it never stands a chance. Keeping our minds on tornadoes, I want you to stop and think uh, about mobile homes in the event of a tornado. Lacking any kind of foundation, they are tossed about when even small tornadoes come because they lack a foundation. So in this passage, which is essentially just one long illustration from multiple perspectives, Jesus is making a singular point. The quality of one's life is determined by the roots of that life. What a life produces and its ability to weather storms is determined completely by how properly rooted they are. My grandma McGinnis kept a written record of her everyday life, a journal from the mid-60s until she died in March of 2003, almost 40 years of a written record of her life that none of us obviously were privy to look at and, until she passed. And as I got my turn with it, I, I noticed that uh, it was mostly the mundane documentation of daily living in rural northwest Arkansas who came by the house that day, how the garden was doing, 
how the weather was. And I glanced at those words, but I was more interested in seeing what she wrote down on the extraordinary days that come to a life, uh, especially the tragic ones. And what you see on each and every one of those pages is evidence of a life deeply rooted in Jesus. Unfortunately, my grandma lived her entire life in a theological world that never allowed her to shake the gnawing feeling that God might take away her salvation for the slightest transgression. She never knew the blessing of being eternally secure in Christ when we surrendered to Him as Savior because she was never able to attend a church that taught that. She couldn't drive, so she had to walk to church, and the nearest one was filled with sweet people and led by a sweet pastor who loved her dearly and took care of her, but it was a church that taught members that you could not only lose your salvation, you could lose it easily. And so if she were here uh, today, 22 plus years later, and I got the opportunity to talk to her, I would, I would bring her to these verses. And I would, I would point out to her words that I didn't cover in my review of the passage just a few minutes ago. I, I'd, I'd bring her to verse 46, which says this, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Now, on the surface, those may not be, at least sound like the, the most encouraging words that you could hear, but they're actually positive reinforcement for someone like Leora Byler McGinnis of Garfield, Arkansas. She called Jesus Lord and then did what he told her. And as such, her life had deep roots in Jesus. And on all of the days, good ones, extraordinary ones, tragic ones, that's what came out of her. Jesus came out of her. Now, I hope all of us have been blessed in our lives with a Grandma McGinnis. And I hope that we see in their lives Jesus coming out, and I hope we aspire to be that kind of person. So how do we get there? How do we have those same kinds of deep roots? I think if we think back on our passage, two things are going to come out to us. In order to have those deep roots, it first must start with the heart. To have deep roots, you have to start with the heart. Now, in one sense, that that tracks for us because it's really uh, a, a direct reflection of what Jesus said. Fruit reveals the character of the heart, but if we are not careful here, we might misunderstand what Jesus really means. And let me see if I can kind of explain it. The prevailing spiritual gravity of our world is that spiritual success is achieved through action. In other words, we believe that what we do changes who we are. One of my favorite movies came out five summers ago called Yesterday. Anybody see Yesterday? All right, a few of you. A few of you. It's about a struggling musician who gets a concussion in a bicycle accident during a worldwide 12-second Blackout, And he wakes up in the hospital to find out that the, the music of the Beatles never existed. But he remembers it all. And so he comes up with this plan to present the songs to a world that's never heard them as his own and achieve wealth and fame that had never been possible for him. And in the beginning, I mean, he's enjoying it. I mean, he's... He's, he's just uh, on a rocketing upward trajectory, and he thinks, all I have to do is to continue to play these notes and sing these words and make these songs my own in this world that has never heard them, and they're none the wiser. But it doesn't take him long to begin to feel a crushing burden, that you can't just pretend to be something you're not without it beginning to devastate you on the inside. You feel the dissonance, and you begin to realize that what I appear on the outside is nothing at all who I am on the inside. This is not authentically me. 
And that's what I mean when I talk about the belief that what we do changes who we are. So when I say that deep roots start with the heart, what my experience as a pastor tells me is that people process what Jesus is saying is that we have to work, work, we have to do stuff to change our heart. But that's not at all what Jesus is even insinuating here. We don't make apple trees by tying apples to cactuses. We get apples because the tree is an apple tree. So when, when I say developing deep roots starts with the heart, I'm not talking about action. I'm talking about transformation. In order for Jesus to show up in our lives on the outside, Jesus has to be on the inside. He has to be our root. Jesus will not show up in my life if the character of my life remains Derek. So where does this transformation start? Well, Luke has already indicated to us how he understands this transformation takes place. It starts with repentance. And we know that because in Luke chapter 3, he records for us kind of a summary of the ministry and the preaching of a man named John the Baptist. And he includes in it how John viewed the relationship between repentance and fruit bearing. So he records him as saying to the crowds, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, fruit flows from repentance. And so what he's doing is challenging as a rebuke the belief among the Pharisees, a group of people who were supremely uh, wrapped up in what they were doing. He was saying that your actions, what you are doing, is not changing who you are. They were trying to hang apples on cactuses, metaphorically speaking. And so John the Baptist tells them that the only actions that matter to God are those that proceed from a transformed heart. Heart transformation is the result of repentance. So, the process of developing deep roots and producing Christ-likeness in our lives starts with a heart that has been transformed by repentance. And this is actually the point of the foundation metaphor in the second half of our passage today. What causes the house to stand against the storm isn't that it's a different house. What causes it to stand against the storm is that it has a different foundation. Thus, the key to becoming different is to be made different by repentance and surrender to Jesus as Lord. So, deep roots start with the heart, a heart that has been transformed through repentance and given over to Jesus who remakes it in his image and then begins to use our lives as the vehicle uh, through which he lives his life on earth. It starts with the heart, but then it ends with obedience. Starts with the heart, and then it ends with obedience, which is the exact opposite of how most of us approach life with God. We, we always want to begin with the doing for Jesus than to start with the becoming by Jesus. We want to do before we become, which we could all pull off, really, if it weren't for the pervasive depth of sin in our lives, which is Jesus' point in the Sermon on the Mount as it is recorded by Matthew. There, Jesus points out that the person who, who, who doesn't kill but is still angry is just hanging apples on a cactus. That the person who may not commit physical adultery, but has a heart filled with lust, is still hanging apples on a cactus. And then he concludes with some shocking words. The standard that we are to shoot for in our lives, the goal of authentic spirituality, is to become reflections of the very character of God. 
not just to do enough good things. We are to reflect the character of God. And only when our lives do that are we justified for Him. And the only way that can happen is because our hearts become His. We surrender ourselves to Him, and His life begins to take root in our lives so that we're no longer pretending we are being obedient and authentic. And singing words and playing the notes of our faith uh, merely uh, from an external perspective is never going to accomplish that. So we must be transformed at the heart level. We must repent and give ourselves to Jesus, and only then does our obedience become a factor in our spiritual health. But then, when that happens, our obedience is important because it is one of those markers that we look to to say, is my heart transformed by Jesus? Someone who would say, I've given my life to Jesus, but whose life doesn't bear the marks of obedience would, by Jesus' own words be lying about Jesus being the Lord of their lives. Let's go back and look at verse 46 again. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? What's Jesus saying? He is saying that it is logically inconsistent to claim him as Lord, which means king. It is logically inconsistent to claim him as king and to ignore what he says. And the parable of the houses and the foundations show that a proclamation of Jesus without a commitment to obedience to Jesus will eventually be exposed as someone who was not rooted in Jesus, did not have their foundation in Jesus at all. So then how does obedience help us deepen those roots? If the foundation is what's important, how does obedience make it any stronger? It does so in the goal of obedience. It is different than it was before we had a transformed heart. Over and over, Jesus taught that we need to continue to do the things you would expect his followers would need to do just differently with a different goal. Uh, to, to explain this in the Sermon on the Mount as recorded by Matthew, Jesus begins to talk about how the spiritual exercises that his hearers have been accustomed to practicing all these years needed to continue, but they needed to be approached differently. Let me give you an example of how this might work. Uh, I want you to think, I want you to think about something with which you struggle. Let's just say, let's just say that maybe you struggle with pride. And you think, I'm not going to be prideful anymore. I'm going to be humble. Before long, what happens? Man, I sure am humble. <laughs> and then the whole thing is undone, right? It's all completely undone. This is what Jesus is getting at when he uses three spiritual practices that were familiar to his hearers as examples, giving to the needy, prayer, and fasting. He says, uh, continue to give to the needy, but in a way where the focus is on God and not the action. He says, continue to pray, but in a way when the focus is on God and not your commitment to pray. He says, continue to fast, but in a way where the focus is on God and not how spiritual you are because you've missed a meal. Because that's ultimately why God wants us to practice these things. Not simply to do them, but to engage them to give glory to him, to bless him, to experience him. And doing that, engaging him, and glorifying him, and blessing him, and experiencing him, infuses us with vitality that we're lacking in trying the Jesus stuff and joy that we are lacking. And that gets us so, so filled with life that we deepen our roots in Him even more, which increases our vitality and increases our joy, which deepens our roots in Him. And it goes on and on and on. So in closing, let me say this. I don't believe anybody, any one of you, this service, last service. I don't think anybody would be here today if they didn't want a better life. Look, 
I am not a good enough preacher for you to show up every Sunday to just be spellbound by my oratory. I know that's not why you're here. You're here because you want to have a better life, and you are hoping to grab something through something said or sung here that will help you get there. So then, let me make it as simple as I can. The biggest roadblock most of us face to a better life is that we have adopted a backward approach to getting there. We want to stay basically who we are, just a better version of who we are. So we try to hang apples on the cactus and tell ourselves that's enough when deep down we know that it's really not. So for a better life, for a transformed life, for a Jesus-infused life, reverse the flow of your efforts. Start with transformation by surrendering yourself to Jesus as your Savior and Lord if you've not already done that. If you are realizing today that your entire approach to spiritual life is to try to do stuff to re-adorn who you are, to hang apples on the cactus, you need to realize and you need to embrace and you need to grab hold of this truth. You will never get where you're going until you say, I am nothing but Jesus is everything and surrender yourself to him as Savior. It starts with the heart. It has to be transformed through salvation. But if that has happened to you, then begin to ask Ask yourselves, in what ways am I roadblocking the life of Jesus from, from showing up in my life? Or in what ways am I letting Jesus show up strongly, but I'm walling him off because I still want to harbor a certain kind of sin or a certain kind of sinful attitude in my life? If you will begin to release yourself to that which was within you in Jesus Christ, you will find yourself doing his will by the power that he supplies, and you'll grow in him deep roots which start to show him in your life, and those deep roots begin to take hold of you and allow you to take hold of him when life's storms do come. It starts with the heart. It ends with obedience, and Jesus provides all of it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.